This evening I'm going to talk about how we in the distribution electricity business prepare for winter. But we actually do a bit more than prepare for winter. We actually have a, a plan that covers us for the whole year because we, we have more events other than just the winter that affects us. But what we're trying to protect, um, uh, in terms of UK power networks, we run three networks. We run the Eastern Network, which is East Anglia. We run the London Network and we run the South East Network. Um, Originally, there were 14 distribution companies within, uh, within the UK. Um, we're down to six now. Um, and you can see the amalgamation of some of those there. The latest one being WPD, who's just picked up uh, the Midlands and, uh, and the East Midlands. Um, from there, you can see the scale of the network that we look after. Uh, we have three million customers in the East, um, about 2.2 million in the South and London. Um, uh, the interesting bit about the London, if you look at the size of the area in London compared to the east or the, or the southeast, significantly smaller area, but actually capacity wise, um, actual peak demand um, is it, it's, it's bigger than the southeast, but it's slightly smaller than the east. So there are some subtle differences in those networks in the size of them, but also in the, uh, in the energy that they transport around. Um, you'll notice again. There's no overhead line in London, there is in the east and south east. Uh, and that's one of our biggest threats is the uh, overhead network because it's open to the elements more than the underground network. Albeit the underground network doesn't like the rain, doesn't like the salt, all those sorts of issues. Um, uh, just to show you the voltage levels we deal with, the red line on the, on the, on the uh, left hand side is National Grid, uh, 400, the grid network that covers the whole of the country. Uh, we take uh, intakes at, uh, at 400 or 275 and it's transformed down to 132 kV and that's where we take it into our network going right the way down to the domestic supplies at 240, uh, uh, 230 sorry, or 400 volts. And there's a, an, an array of different voltages in between. So, um, as a company, when it comes to our objectives um, for the existing network, uh, we're there to uh, uh, safely uh, operate the network, um, dispatch and repair when we have faults, because our network faults on a daily basis. Um, we dispatch field teams, we provide customer service, uh, and we have robust emergency plans in place to allow us to, to deal with all that. Um, today I'm going to concentrate on the network. Uh, I could talk, uh, uh, do a separate talk on just customer service and all the elements we put in there. So we do all of those things, but I'm not concentrating on those today. Um, this is just to give you a, a, a scale of the amount of activity we have on the network on an annual basis. Um, so if you imagine these are all the different voltage levels we, we deal with, and these are the typical fault volumes we would expect to see on those networks on a yearly basis. So on our 11 kV networks for the, for the east and the south east, we would expect typically between 8 to 12 faults a day. Now on the high voltage network in London, we'd, we'd look for a couple, a couple of days, some days we don't get any, going down to you know, up into the, the 20s and 30s uh, uh, for, the, for the other side. Um, and we also do a lot of stuff where we switch customers off to, to actually make connections, make repairs, replace assets. You know, all to do with the asset management cycle. A lot of this, this line here is dealing with our, our asset replacements, our repairs, and all those things that go with the normal asset management activities. So, just moving on to uh, uh, emergency or, or, or network uh, emergency and disaster recovery. As I said, we will concentrate on the, the bottom one of the, the first block, which is the system emergency, which deals with weather, and that's what we, uh, we have to deal with in the winter. But, but actually, we deal all the year round with uh, a number of, of issues that we have to be ready for uh, and prepared for, uh, and so we have contingency plans in place for all of those. 
So we have black start. So if the national grid switches off completely, we have to have the ability to build our networks back up in coordination with national grid. And we have a number of codes of practice. We have license conditions that regulate how we deal with that and how we interact with national grid in those areas. Um, if there is ever a, a, a shortage uh, uh, um, from problems on the network, for instance, it's not black star, but we could have um, insufficient generation or things like that, we might get to the stage where we have to rotate to disconnect. Again, we have another set of plans that deals with how we rotate to disconnect, how we deal with the customers, how we switch you off. If you look on your electricity bills, you'll have a little letter on there somewhere, and that tells you what block you are in terms of rotor disconnection. So if we go into that process, you can look on your bill and you say, oh, I'm a G, and then we publicise that tells you G goes off at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Um, so it's a plan that's all put in place. Um, demand management, again, that's a bit around the, 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 uh, around the, uh, around the uh, rotor disconnection black spot. Um, we also have disaster recovery. We run a 24-7 um, facility in terms of our network and therefore we have to have ability to manage that through our control centres and we have a number of um, means of disaster recovery. We have duplicate control centres that just sit there waiting for something to happen to into our existing centres which we can completely decamp into and, and keep our services going. Um, we also, going down to the IT stuff, uh, I think our servers on our control systems, we have three servers. Um, two running constantly, one in reserve. If we ever lose a server, the reserve one flips in, uh, the other one drops out, so we've always got two running at the same time. So, in terms of what we do within day-to-day -day running, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background to make sure that we're ready for any event. Uh, winter events, uh, tend to relate to weather, um, a bit more, we have snow, we have ice, uh, we also have wind, we have gale, um, all those things affect us, and depending on what time of year they affect, uh, uh, hit, if they hit, means that we have to deal with them in different ways. So if there's leaves on the trees and the wind blows, it has a bigger impact than when all the trees uh, are, are off. So we, we have plans in place to deal with all those situations. So these are the key elements that we're looking to protect because um, <coughs> if you imagine, go back to the, the, the original fault volumes for the year, we're set up to deal with those volumes on a day-to-day -day basis. When they start to escalate, you start to have issues around understanding what's happening, public safety, all of those issues, restoration times, you've got to keep on top of. And I think, uh, as you mentioned earlier, information now is key um, um, go back 10 years, we were most probably very regional. Uh, we're now three companies. We have to report into a centre. We have to disseminate out from a central point to understand what's going on. And those are all the learning points that we've had to get to, get to grips with to bring all that information in. And, and years ago, people used to sit there shuffling bits of paper around going, go out here, go out there. But it, it, it doesn't help the gathering of information to understand what's happening to a network when it's under stress. So all of those things we've, uh, we've had to deal with. We have to deal with our vulnerable customers, we hold a register, so when we go into a system emergency, that's when we the volumes of faults get to a stage where we're over a normal day and it's get to a stage where we can't cope. We have to understand how we deal with those people. Uh, and again, we have to manage the media, we have to inform them, we have to keep customers informed of the communication. Thing. So these are the key elements we look to manage and support through any emergency that we're going into. Um, to assist that, uh, our plan sits up that we have a, a number of strategic um, points on our network that we use to either uh, to either um, bring in resources to, uh, they manage the output of work to the field directly. Uh, we have our, our key site, our control centre that manages all the network and what's going on in the network. 
Now these sites around here, the, the, the white ones, the, uh, the tactical centres or the emergency resource centres, um, we actually ensure that we have certain reserve supplies of equipment, plant equipment, uh, there at a, an agreed working level that are locked up ready for an emergency. So we have our day-to-day -day facilities that we replenish stores to the, to the, to the work fleet um, for, for their day-to-day -day activities but we actually maintain strategic stocks all over in these, each of these locations to ensure in emergency there's sufficient spares um, for people to go out on the network, repair broken lines, poles, transformers. Because uh, one of the other issues we have, we're talking about winter here, but in the summer we have a huge issue with lightning and the impact it has on our network, transformers, overhead lines, all those things are affected by lightning. Uh, and they, the, the, the stores required to maintain those as well. So those are the centres that we've set up um, as part of our strategic plan to ensure that we can get a timely distribution of resources and spares um, across the network. If you know, very few in London because we have very few overhead lines. Um, to assist us, um, we work with uh, we work with um, the Met Office, uh, and part of that system is, is that we set up a, a number of levels of uh, engagement we go through. Um, full system emergencies when we've resourced everybody out there out in the field and they're, and they're, and they're, um, and they're, they're, they're working away to restore supplies. But we start to warn people as we become aware of things happening. So we could be sending out um, a weather watch could be a week ahead if we know that bad weather's coming, saying that we're watching the weather. Be aware, we might be calling on the additional resources, we might want you to work weekends, we might want you to do something. So it's a warning to all of our staff. When it starts to come in that that is going to happen, we then move into the next stages, which is, a, which is actually a system emergency warning. And that's, that, that stage there starts to tell people you have to be available. Uh, they are contracted, that they have to make themselves available. They're only not allowed to be available, I think it's twice a year now, so if we call this. Um, most probably in the last three months, we've gone into a system of emergency one, a warning once, and we've been in the watch about three times, over the, just before Christmas and after now. Uh, we haven't been in a system of emergency for less than 12 months, which is good. <laughs> um, to assist uh, what I just talked about there, we actually have a management structure that deals with uh, any emergency. So we, this could be a, a winter emergency, but this is any emergency we have on the network. Um, we have this level here, which we talked about earlier, which shows you where all the tactical and operational units work. We have tactical teams um, which uh, help to support these uh, uh, resource centres. And then we go up into strategic and we go up into our EMT, IMT, which is our the board level. Um, and they call and they'll sit uh, and they will deal with the impact it's going to have on customers, the company, uh, press and things like that and they decide whether we need to call more resources in, whether we go for help other places. Um, as an industry, we have, a, uh, we have a, um, a process where we can call upon any other distribution network operator and ask them have they got any resources to spare, can they let them have it, can they, can they let them So those are the sort of decisions that this structure sets up. Um, we rehearse this on an annual basis, uh, normally before the winter. The uh, IMT, MT, we exercise about four times a year to go through exercises, process procedures to, 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 uh, to make sure that they're ready. Um, and one of, the, one of the big advantages we, we gained from the Olympics that we, we actually had 10, 10 exercises that we exercised through this whole process. Um, because of the Olympic Games and the Olympics being in London, 
and us being the network operator. Uh, and some of the learning came up out from there was the command and control that you have to get into. You, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a soft management style. You have to get into a command and control. Um, you learn a lot from the emergency services where they are very directive, um, and, and we found that uh, we most probably faffed around a lot prior to that. We could have a conference call that lasts an hour or two hours, and everybody walks away going, what was that all about? We've got those conference calls most probably down to 20 minutes at the most, can get them down to 10 minutes, and everybody's very clear when they leave that conference call what their, what their responsibilities are and what they've got to do. So, so, so in recent, uh, yeah, in the last 12 months, we've learned a lot about that structure. We did, we did add a bit on just to complement that, complement the uh, Olympics, but it, uh, it basically uh, worked on the uh, business as usual. Um, again, as an industry, we're quite mature that we we have a we have quite a um, mature national emergency plans in place, going right, uh, right up to government through, uh, through our government uh, body, which is DEC, uh, and these, uh, these groups that sit, uh, I, I sit on this group here, the EC3, uh, and we look, at, we look at how robust the industry is to emergencies, not just winter weather, anything that comes along. Uh, and they exercise us, we, we have a tier one exercise every one or two years. Uh, we had a tier one last year on top of the Olympics that looked at uh, rotor disconnection. We haven't got one this year, but we'll have another tier two, or sorry, tier one exercise, uh, which is in 2014, which we know will be an electricity one because we've just been informed. So it'll take about 12 months to plan that. Uh, that's just really just another picture of how how the uh, uh, emergency response sits in in terms of uh, uh, the local levels and, and, and how things do. But it's just to show you that you know we, there is a, a national picture that not just us dealing with we did on a national level. Um, that's the end of the slides uh, presentation. I have got a couple that I will show you. Um, Um, just to show you the last storm, the last, the worst storm we've had in, in the last 17 years is in 2007 um, in January. And just to show you what the scale of it was, um, this is the impact it had in terms of time and the number of customers affected in our eastern uh, network. So, so it's the initial impact going right the way down to how long it takes us to clear up the last, the last fault. So you can see the scale. Um, and what happens is, is you get, this, you get this, this effect where you get very fast recovery at the beginning where the higher voltages are restored um, and then you go down to this tail when you're looking at low voltage individual customer services not being, uh, not being uh, or needing to be restored and that becomes the long tail. And that's the bit that really causes the causes the problem. So the, the impact of that event was uh, nearly half a million customers were off supply. So that's mm, not quite, but almost comparable to what happened in the US at the weekend in terms of their severe weather. Um, public safety is the things that we have to deal with. That overhead line there while it's close to the ground is most probably still alive. The person who's seen that <coughs> man, who was one of our yeah, when we were EDF, was uh, most probably uh, quite shocked. Um, and this really just shows you over a number of years how we've improved from this, this bottom line here, which is a restoration performance uh, when we had severe weather in 2002 to the area that we're performing at now, which is further up in that, that, uh, that uh, top left-hand corner. Um, 
and that's what it looks like. And then your faults and all they are all over the place. So just to, to give you a scan. I mean, that's the end of my presentation. Any questions? My name's Jason Glasson. I'm from the Highways Agency. Um, it's probably a, a... I've been invited to speak at different presentations and sometimes you think, oh, I'm not sure about this one. I don't think, I think I'm going to be pushing it. Maybe I have to blag a little bit or what have you. I think this one I felt very comfortable in giving because, I, because of my two roles, current role and previous role. So just to explain, at the moment I'm the Asset Management Development Team Leader for the Highways Agency. So responsible for developing a number of um, oh, fails on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I'll dramatically pause now, just creates yeah, the pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we're, I'm responsible for developing a number of um, asset management tools, such as a, an integrated asset management system, and also sort of some decision support tools to support the work we do but also looking at the capability, so specifically an asset management capability related to training and basically sort of that hateful word of upskilling people and providing our workforce with the necessary skills they need. So that's my current role, and I've been in this role about 12 months. Previous to that, I was the Harvest Agency's National Winter Manager, hence this talk today. So I've kind of tried to, to merge the two together and sort of see my, my previous role was sort of what the agency does in winter and how it plans, how it relates to the winter strategy, but then try and uh, sort of relate that to my current role within asset management, hopefully just to make it a little bit more interesting, obviously given your particular sort of fields and, and where your interests lie. No, no. Okay, so in terms of what well, tonight, just I, I don't know what you know about the Iowa's agency, so just a little brief intro to what the Iowa's agency does. Sort of a winter service. Sort of so obviously most of you will have seen our fleet, but just to really explain a little bit about what goes on behind just getting that bridge actually out the road and trundling up and down. Um, really want to sort of more focus on sort of our winter service that we've got now and sort of how did that come into being. So what led to the development of that winter service and it's kind of a little bit of a painful journey for us and, and sort of it I think it's worth just covering that and then obviously those, those important links to, to asset management for us. <coughs> Okay, so Highways Agency, we maintain and operate the Strategic Road Motorway uh, Network in, in England, sort of Motorway and Trunk Road Network. Um, it's valued at just over 100 billion pounds, so fairly sizable asset. Uh, we, it accounts for about 10% of the road network in England, but it carries one, well it's 10%, so kind of 90% local roads, but carries one third of traffic and two thirds of um, heavy traffic. So obviously it, it takes a pound and it, it takes it. It's under a lot of stress, it's at or near capacity all the time. And obviously it's, it is that critical long distance travel between ports and sort of long distance destinations. So that's obviously just, um, just briefly covered there. In terms of the services that we operate, obviously we, we've traditionally been sort of a road builder. So you know, we, we like cutting tapes on schemes, we get ministers in lots of photos. And that, that's been the traditional role of the, the highways agency, but we've moved um, in sort of over the last few years to more of a maintainer and operator. So it is about making better use of the network that, that we've got. And obviously operating that better. So sort of top left photo is that's one of a, a controlled motorway scheme. So it is about sort of hard, hard, um, hard shoulder running and sort of controlling the flow of traffic to try and actually improve the, the capacity level of the network. We still do major schemes, so we, we, we've still got sort of either major widening schemes, new roads, new routes going in, so we, we still do that role. And obviously our traffic officer service as well, so you've probably seen our uh, traffic officers up and down the network. Obviously again, trying to improve reliability and to support and assist customers that may be in difficulties on the network and obviously attend major incidents, mainly to try and uh, reduce the, the clearance time so they can attend the site and actually if previously we would have seen several hours in the closure, Big delays. Actually, if we can reduce the time of that closure, we can obviously get the network up and running, recover from that incident, and actually try and get traffic running again to reduce overall congestion on the network. And then, of course, winter service, hence the reason I'm sort of here tonight. So, that's one of our, our new vehicles. We're very proud of a, a new fleet of sort of um, very high tech vehicles that we've got on. I will just talk briefly. I wasn't going to talk about this, but I can never resist talking about them. It's the last project that I did. Um, we've got Two types of vehicles, um, now two makes of vehicles, Schnitt and Roma Quick, 
and the, the main difference is with, with these tanks along the side here, and that's a, a, it's a pre-wet vehicle. So actually when it's spreading the salt, instead of uh, following a normal vehicle and sort of clouds of salt and grip flying everywhere and sort of car being pelted with, with the uh, salt flying at the back, actually it, it's a, it applies a brine solution to the salt as it's being applied. So we can use a lot less salt because the salt goes straight down on the road surface and, and doesn't sort of, isn't sort of cascading around, but also it stays where, it, where it's put, so it's almost sprayed onto the carriageway. And so again, you can use far less salt. It's very accurate, it sprays the edge of the carriageway and then stops. We don't lose it into the, the natural environment, so it's environmentally better. But also, obviously, then, it, it's far more effective. So it starts to work as soon as it hits the ground. So it's, it's a major step forward for us. In terms of our um, winter responsibility, it is a statutory uh, obligation that we've got, so in, and that's part of the quote, to ensure so far as reasonably practical that safe passage along the highway is not endangered by ice or snow. So there was a number of test cases that went through and actually that's established, that's a statutory requirement. As usual, reason, what's reasonable becomes very subjective, but explaining reasonable to a coroner is, is their view of reasonable is, is, is quite extreme. And the evidence that we have to come back with to actually demonstrate if there's been a, a fatality on the network, that the amount of evidence that we need to provide is, is quite a lot. We need to show that when we have treated the network that that treatment was appropriate timing, it was appropriate type, that it was carried out, we've got ways of verifying that. So there's a lot of evidence that sits behind that. So that, although that looks a fairly easy sort of commitment to come to, it's actually fairly stringent on us and it's, it's very big demand. That the photograph there is actually a photograph that's taken, I think, either two or three years ago, and that is snow, it's not cloud, and that, that's a snow cover across the network at the time. And that was, a, I think that was the 2009-10 year, and that was a, a very stressful year for us. So we, um, it's a 24-7 service, we operate all the time, and we treat the whole network. So unlike local authorities where they'll have uh, a treatable network and a non-treatable network, we actually treat all of our network all the time. Um, the fleet will cover typically about 2 million miles a year, so that's on sort of a, an average to severe winter, and typically we'll use about 300,000 tonnes of salt across the network. And one network treatment, just to try and put that into perspective, we use about 3,000 tonnes if we complete sort of one uh, network treatment. But I'll come back to salt later. It's, of course, there's a few problems over the last few years, and anyone who read the newspapers will probably know. In terms of our resources that we've got, um, 230 weather stations, so that's, you've probably seen them along the side of the, the network, so we can record um, either wind speed, air pressure, um, precipitation amounts, and it's got uh, sensors in the carriageway surface as well, so we can see uh, road surface temperatures and also sort of number of sensors actually in the carriageway as well, so we can see sort of core road construction temperatures as well as well as then looking at the salinity on the road surface and that will give us a prediction then as to when the surface will freeze. So based on the amount of salt that we've got down at any one time, the sensor will say, okay, well, this, the surface, this stretch of road will actually freeze at minus 10, minus 11, minus 12, and then our, our service providers then can, can look at that information and make those judgments as to when they deploy further treatments. As I've mentioned, these are our two types of vehicles at the bottom, but, but different providers got the same technology on both of them. Um, the Highways Agency actually owns those. We don't operate them. Our, we've got um, service providers, contractors that actually drive and operate those vehicles, but we, we, there are our vehicles and they operate those. Um, they operate from, our, we've got a network of depots alongside, so alongside the motorway, they operate from there. And again, coming back to salt, we typically start the year with about 280,000 tonnes and there'll be um, in-season purchases on those and obviously then We'll, we'll get. There's two supply. There's two main suppliers or two mines um, in, in uh, England, right, based up north, and one in Baldby, one in Cheshire, and uh, obviously then we'll get one, one or two of those. And sometimes over the last few years, we've needed to uh, supplement that with overseas so But again, I'll, I'll come back to that. <coughs> so in terms of what actually happens, so I'll just I'll just briefly. Cover it. It's not sort of the main. I want to get onto the sort of the winter strategy, but obviously we've got the service providers, and they'll be monitoring those roadside weather station information. And each contractor has its own weather forecast, a dedicated weather forecaster as well. And there'll be a, usually about four forecasts every 24 hours. So they're constantly monitoring those forecasts. 
looking at with our we have a, a Met Office embedded with us as well to give us 24 uh, national forecasts and they'll be constantly updating those and, and it's not just about looking at what the weather is now obviously it is about predicting over that next 24 sort of 12 to 24 hours and then identifying what treatments need to be deployed but as we said at the bottom it, it, the timing of those is absolutely critical obviously we need to get the salt down on the carriageway and activate it so it isn't just about throwing some salt down on the, on the carriageway surface the salt needs to be crushed and then it forms a brine and it's that brine that actually stops any ice forming so we need passing traffic to do that and we need moisture to do that and it's doing all of that whilst trying to keep out of the peak times as well we obviously can't do that in the middle of a, a a peak hour when there's lots of traffic on the roads we need to try and time it as well so that that becomes it is a very very complicated it, it sounds easy that you just look at some data and then sort of send and send the vehicle fleet out but given obviously the amount of network sort of it's, i think seven and a half thousand miles network that we've got to do that across the network when there's lots of different weather, weather patterns going around it changes at the last minute Whatever, and to time that in amongst those travel patterns is it, it's a big challenge to our service providers. I think they do very well, I think they're getting better at it, and again, looking at the, the next slide, I think we'll look at a couple of slides of Colin White Friday, they, they've learned a lot from it. So, why do we change? I hate that photograph. It's the one that sends shivers literally down through me every time. Anyone who's worked in winter service, I think, it, well, certainly within the highways agency, is the same. That's White Friday. For those of you who lucky enough not to have heard of White Friday, it's when we managed to strand several hundred motorists on the M11 in January 2003. We managed to keep them there all night and parts of the agency um, weren't aware of what was going on. So there was a number of issues that, that we've addressed. So we've come a long, long way since then and that prompted a major rethink into not just really the, the winter service that we provide, but sort of how do we provide the winter service, how do we communicate during a major incident, how do we manage that incident, so sort of the incident management, the communications that we've got, that prompted the, the production of the 10 year winter strategy, which, which I'll come on to now. So just looking at sort of, this isn't all the strands, it's, it's as usual with the strategy, it's a weighty document, so I won't bore you with all the details of that, but I've just picked out a, a few issues that I thought were relevant tonight. So. In terms of um, defined standards, we, we better define some of the standards that our service providers work to. So we obviously gave them treatment times, we defined what requirements they'd have for keeping lanes open during snow, and we developed what's called our severe weather plan template. And a lot of that was about rather than telling them what to do and just leaving it and specifying it, it was about giving them guidance but for them to propose back to us what they would actually do within those sort of constraints then. So, they, they own it and we, we test that during the tender process as well now and with, it, with an increased weighting of that document it sets our expectations and very, it's very clear as to the level of um, importance and priority that we see now over providing a robust winter service. Again on under, underneath there then in terms of maybe some of the language that, that you would recognise it, it is about resource management, contract and supplier management and looking at our management of outsourced activities. So again, it's not something that we've got that direct control of, but it is about how do we manage that through, through our outsourced suppliers. Again, incident management. Sometimes there, there will be incidents on the network and it, you know, we just can't prevent those. But a lot of what we focused on since White Friday and, and some other reports we've had done is how do we respond to those incidents? So how do we actually respond to it and get the network opened and available to traffic as quickly as possible? So we, in, there's a uh, process of hot and cold debriefs. So there's a, an immediate debrief, immediately following an incident, just getting the, the relevant people together, understand very quick lessons learned, obviously for that particular incident and we'll address that and is there anything wider that we can share amongst our other suppliers to actually uh, to, uh, mitigate or reduce the chances of likelihood that it will occur again. And then we have other debriefs then which will sort of let the dust settle a little bit and actually bring together some wider stakeholders, maybe emergency services and get a, a wider group together and actually really look at the sort of the incident timeline, go right through and actually track what happened and what we again what we could have done better and what lessons we could have learned from that individual incident. So again in sort of on our terms incident response time or incident response generally. 
and performance management. So we've got a number of uh, winter service KPIs, but importantly, we've had them before, but they were very difficult to measure. So if we, we've looked a lot at, well, how, if we've got these measures in, we feel they're important, how do we measure them and actually really hold our, our service providers and our contractors to account on those. And obviously they are important, they're not just about contract compliance, they actually mean something in terms of the quality of the service that will be delivered. So again, assets and systems performance, performance and condition monitoring. So again, coming back to those themes that we would recognise. So the 10-year winter strategy wasn't put together on the basis of a sort of a formal asset management process. I've kind of looked look back and actually almost coincidentally, and I don't know whether that's uh, sort of a good coincidence or the way that the actual asset management sort of structures and documentation was put together, but it actually does pull out a number of those themes. And I, I, sort of in, in my current role now, I can see those themes looking back at the way the strategy was developed. You can see quite clearly that they do start now. In terms of just on that last um, part there where I mentioned about holding uh, sort of our providers to account and actually challenging them on their, their level of performance, this is a, a um, system that we've got for monitoring our fleet across the network. So we have a, what's called a, a fleet star. So all of our, each vehicle is fitted with a data logging device, so we can, it's an internet based uh, solution, so we can log into that, see where any particular vehicle is, what that vehicle is doing at that time, whether it's spreading, how much salt it's spreading, whether it's got its snow plow down, uh, whatever, whether, obviously whether it's parked up. And also then, importantly, afterwards we can run reports on that to see if it's exceeded its treatment times, whether, um, bless you. Um, even down to how economical the drivers have been, so whether they a bit heavy footed on the accelerator and we can, we can give them environmental scores as well. So it's about contract compliance and about sort of their, their performance in an environmental sense as well. They're not targeted on that currently, but that's not to say that obviously in the future that we wouldn't want to look at something like that. The system's capable of it, it's just whether we have the appetite to do that with our providers. Just going back to again to a number of strands, so we've got improved risk management. <coughs> this was really about Looking at, looking at risk and then looking at obviously who's best capable and, and who's the best party in managing that risk. I think a lot of it was about before us providing specification and then suppliers actually obviously performed to that specification. Now it's about them proposing back to us that, that level of service. The service provider identifies the risks, they manage those risks and then obviously we, we're accountable and, and we oversee their management of the risk. So it really is about assigning those risks to, to the, the most relevant parties and again, through proper reporting, holding them to account on management of them. Again, I mentioned the, the lessons learned in terms of incidents, but also in terms of winter, we now hold annual workshops. So immediately after the winter season, we go through with every area or region and really look at the, the major incidents that they've had during the winter season and the general level of performance, any challenges that they've had. And then those are either sorted out locally because they, they may be just a particular route, a particular junction, or if we can see themes emerging across different areas, then we'll bring that into a national uh, program of improvements, and then that's implemented before the start of the next season. So hopefully there is that cycle of continuous improvement, and we don't see um, problems that, that are preventable repeating themselves season after the, season after season. You know, we, we use that we get it within. That's a multi-agency process, so it's not just that I was agency, we bring other stakeholders into that, and obviously with respect to any local authorities or motoring associations, freight transport associations, as a customer and as a user, they will then bring that other, other perspective to those. And we've got better tools. So I mentioned uh, the, the new fleet, which we're uh, very proud of. Um, data login, but also the, our, we've got a, a winter reporting system as well now. I mentioned obviously the White Friday earlier on, part of the issue there was the, the lack of visibility that we had on some of the issues that were actually unfolding at the time. There was winter decisions being made, there was uh, obviously events going on and it was the, the incident, or the, the winter response was being managed locally, but there was a, a, a lack of visibility to, to people sort of not directly involved in that particular incident. So we introduced, a, a, again, an internet-based reporting system and mandated that all our contractors and service providers report all the decisions that have been made, all the winter service deployments, 
everything that, that they're actually doing, even down to individual salt stock levels at every depot. Now, and, so to, and all of our senior management can log into that, all of the area teams can log into that. So all the time there is that open visibility, that sort of line of sight reporting from an individual depot right through, if necessary, to our chief executive can actually see what's going on at any time. So I mentioned that then just, just picking up on that theme, so again we can cover salt service delivery and, and fleet. So that's an example there, this, this is one of the winter reports, I don't expect you to read that. But it's about taking that information and, it, and that obviously that's, there's a lot of data there. And then part of the role of the, the National Winter Team then is to actually use that data and make those assessments and actually turn that into a form of intelligence then that we can feed to necessary people within in the, in the agency who need that information. So as an example of that, um, we've obviously had a number of challenges around uh, maintaining adequate salt stocks over the last few years, given the severity of winters we've had. So we take all of that individual <coughs> salt stock levels from the individual depots that we've got, and then the, the solid blue line here is, uh, this was the obviously from uh, last season, about salt usage that we've actually seen to a point, and then we take all of that data, we feed it into another tool that we've developed, and then this line here is an estimation based on forecasts, what we'll see for, the, for that next sort of month to two months forward, then so we can start to see, rather than we've got a problem or everything's fine and suddenly we've got a problem based on conditions as they're unfolding and, and we know that's going to come up in the next few weeks, what are we likely to see in salt stocks? Can we start seeing that we've got a problem somewhere here, if we're predicting something there, so we can actually try and identify a course of action that will help us mitigate the impact of these salt shortages rather than waiting until things are getting a little bit desperate. And this is the, the last one on that. So we've got um, improved winter testing. So I've mentioned the, the lessons learned that we carry out at the end of the season. Before the season starts, we bring together again a number of agencies and put our service providers through the, through the ringer, I suppose is a right way of putting it. That, really test their preparedness. So obviously, you get to the end of the winter season, everybody breathes a huge sigh of relief, I think, and you go through the summer. But then, come the winter, the, the very first deployment that you'll need of the winter, you don't want to be finding out then that either vehicles don't work or you haven't got the right people in the right place at the time. So we'll carry out a number of exercises then, just to make sure that come that come October, November, and you start to get the deployments, that, that people really know what they need to be doing, the winter decision makers know what they're meant to be doing, but also to test, well, if this doesn't work, if it doesn't work as planned, what are, what are the contingency plans? So if we lose a depot through a fire or a flooding or, or even sort of severe weather, can they cope if they, if they lose that? What do they do in those circumstances? So it's about feeding a number of scenarios to them and testing them at that what if, what if, what if, almost to, a, to an impossible degree, just to find out, to make sure that within that reasonable envelope that they'd be able to cope with a number of challenges that they may realistically first. Um, training, so we've developed um, NVQs for all of the um, drivers of the fleet to go through and training for our winter decision makers to make sure that they're carrying out, um, they're identifying consistent um, treatment deployments and obviously for our on-road traffic officer service as well. So look at those things, so that's contingency planning, training, awareness and confidence. So it, it does come back to that, that confidence level we expect our service providers to provide uh, people with appropriate training, but again, in, in some of those more critical areas, we will insist on those qualifications and we will work to develop those qualifications to make sure that, that they can actually demonstrate that they've, they've met our level. And one of the areas that we've notoriously been um, a little bit bad, I suppose, with, with, with any big organisation is communications. And we recognise the, the importance of good communications in severe weather. It isn't just about the Iowa's agency going out and spreading salt and everybody else uh, can carry on driving as, as you know, the same throughout the year. It is about getting people to try and understand some of the difficulties that they may face, even though we've treated the network. So driving at three o'clock on a Sunday morning in the middle of January with a, a blizzard outside is different than driving it on three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon in the middle of July, so that we want people to take some responsibility for their own actions during the winter. It isn't just about us treating the network, and if they've not been able to, to get across Bodmin more, whatever, at the same speed as they always do, it's not necessarily a, a failure on the highest agency's part. 
So we, again, we've looked at a number of ways that we can get different messages across. And um, more recently, obviously, social media, we've got a, a Twitter site, a Twitter presence now. I don't think you call it a Twitter site, such as, I don't know, you know what the terminology is, so it's showing my age there. Um, um, partnership campaigns with RAC, um, AA. So it's not just our own uh, campaigns that we'll deliver, but we'll work with other organisations as well to get, try and get the message across. I mentioned about planning. Planning isn't everything. Uh, we, we've got to be able to react as well. Um, each winter, we, we, we think we've got everything planned for, nothing's going to happen, you know, but we've covered everything, we've experienced all that we're going to experience, and then <coughs> the new winter comes along, we'll face a new challenge that come completely from left field. Um, one that we've had, a, not thankfully, touch wood, not, not so far this year, is the extreme low temperatures that we've seen over the last few years. You've probably again read, read the papers or media that salt stops working after minus eight degrees. Um, it's not quite the case. It, it becomes increasingly less effective after minus eight degrees, but it is about getting it into solution. So if we sort of look at that minus eight, we've had temperatures on our network down to about minus 18. That's minus 18 road surface temperatures. So it has been a big challenge. And how do we react to that challenge? What do we do? What guidance can we give to our service providers? So, the, the, the photograph there is of some trials we did of a, a, a calcium chloride material. So it's, it's like salt, sodium chloride, but this is slightly different. And actually, when you put it down and, it, and you crush it and it starts to form brine, it actually gives off heat. So that, that's the effect of the, the heat there. And one of the, I don't think you can quite read it, but the freezing temperature there is actually forecasted down to minus 22. So basically, saying if we put this down, instead of being sort of sodium chloride temperature, that, that road carriageway should stay as a, as a water, not ice on the surface, down to about minus 22. So it's far, far more effective than sodium chloride. So we are looking at trying to extend our use of that across those regions where we think that those temperatures um, might occur again. Vulnerable locations, again, not a very particular, not a good photograph. Um, despite whatever planning we do, whatever, however ready our service providers are, there are going to be certain locations given the nature, whether that's altitude or traffic levels or what have you, that, that are very, very susceptible to certain types of severe weather. So it is about understanding that and not necessarily absolutely preventing it because we can, but what do we do about it? How do we react to it? And not just sort of react at the time. Can we put in place measures that when it happens, can we then mitigate it and open up that road a lot quicker and then lessen the chances of people getting stranded on the net? And the last slide is, is salt. It's, it's one that's been the bane of our lives over the last few years, and I think a few of us within the agency and local authorities bear the scars of, of salt. Um, obviously, we've had, this, we've had prolonged severe weather. Again, not so much this year, but some of the previous uh, winters, uh, we've had a, an awful lot of bad weather. And I think just some of the, the numbers there kind of uh, demonstrate why we ended up with some of the salt uh, shortages or challenges that we had. Um, nationally, that, that's not just Iowa's agency, so that, that's across the country. We can use, on average, about on a say, so if there's sort of just a snow event, not anything too severe, but, but a snow across the country, we can use 180,000 tonnes in one day. Our usage for one day is about 18,000 tonnes. If we look at the national salt production of the two mines that I mentioned earlier on, they can produce about 10 to 20,000 tonnes. So obviously the numbers don't match. So it is all about having the, the correct, having enough supplies to start with and actually getting authorities to see their way through periods of bad weather and not relying on sort of just-in-time deliveries. I think one of the problems as a country that we faced over the last few years is that given the succession of milder winters up until this last period, um, a number of salt barns and salt storage facilities have actually been sold off by local authorities, because obviously given other priorities and challenges around money to provide essential services, they, they've released those um, facilities that they had. And that's fine, and, and it worked in those milder winters. Unfortunately, obviously, we've experienced some very harsh winters, and then there's that instant demand for instant deliveries then, and obviously based on that 10 to 20,000 tonnes figure, it, it doesn't, the salt suppliers just can't meet that instant demand. So again, that's, some, that's a lesson that's been learned now, and most authorities now have gone back and they've increased storage, they've put in place better plans around and so on. To help out in those previous years that we've done, we imported, I think, 
instead of about half a million tons, about 600,000 tons <coughs> over two years of salt, and that was from countries like Peru. Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm Jason Bridges, <coughs> National Weather Specialist for Network Rail. And my role is more of a national weather uh, resilient specialist. So one of my key tasks and roles is to make sure that the railway is resilient to the weather. And when I say railway, we're talking assisting or train operators, <coughs> passengers getting to the stations and the actual rail infrastructure itself. I'm going to talk around our weather and climate change resilience strategy, which is a little bit more than just talking about how we deal with the weather when it hits, but more about how we're going to deal with it in the future and how we're dealing with climate change. There's a lot of slides here, so obviously we'll push a little bit of time, but I'll, I'll flick through some of the slides and make sure we get the main ones. So Network Rail, we run and maintain the whole of the rail network, so that's 20,000 miles of track, 40,000 bridges, 17 major stations and 2,500 other stations on the network, and 8,200 commercial properties. So it's a, it's a huge asset base that we need to maintain. And the asset base is also, in the large, quite old, falling apart, poorly maintained over the last 100 years. And we're getting to the point where a lot of the asset we need to improve, replace, and improve our maintenance regimes. <coughs> the railway is split at the moment into 10 routes, each route there, each route there highlighted in different colours, um, and the railway on the whole is an absolute roaring success at the moment. We're running more trains, moving more passengers, and we're becoming more punctual, doing it for less money. And you know, it's, it's quite a challenge for us to continue doing that, and to bring down the cost to the end user, being the taxpayers and the travelling public. But it's a, it's a task we're taking on, and we are delivering, but it does take time. Like I say, we're improving the rail network, and these are delay minutes over the years, so we've got from 2002 right through to 2010-11, and these are millions of delay minutes. And you may have seen on the TV programme last night on BBC Two, on some areas of the network, a delay minute can be, in penalty payments, £150. So we're talking mega, mega money in penalty costs between railway companies. Like Network Rail don't run any trains, we own the asset. The infrastructure, our commodity is the asset and selling train paths to the train operators. The problem we've got, and this is taken from the National Risk Register produced by the government, and what you see is the highest risk at the moment to the country they're saying is pandemic influenza, and potentially volcanic eruptions. The other thing you notice is coastal flooding, severe weather low temperatures, heavy snow, heat waves and inland flooding. So the further up that direction is impact and likelihood, less impact, less likelihood. One of the biggest impacts there is the weather and potentially climate change as well. This is looking at how the weather is affecting our public performance measure. Our public performance measure is a measure of train punctuality and perception from uh, customers. So that is on a long journey, that's London to Glasgow for instance, the, it fails public performance measure if it is over nine minutes late. So nine minutes is within public performance, ten minutes is over. And that is it, and short journeys is four minutes. What you see there is these big dips in there each winter as the years have gone on. You see here, last year was quite a good year. Every year we had this massive dip in public performance measure. That's this year so far halfway through winter, we're expecting that to even bigger impact. So although we're doing well, there's a lot of work to be done. And again, looking at the various seasons, spring, summer, autumn and winter, that's the average of the <coughs> 10, 12 years. That's this year so far, we will notice the big ones are becoming more frequent. And the impact on this is 700,000 delay minutes for winter, same again by poor weather and that's it. 50 million pound in payments to train operators or from train operators to network rail to go both ways. Tens of million pounds lost to society. So these are some of our guys out cleaning, cleaning snow from the tracks. Autumn, similarly 250,000 minutes, millions of pounds cost in autumn and the well publicised, leaves on the line, wrong leaves on the line, etc. Um, we actually 
water jet that about a million miles in 74 days of railhead and it still causes a big problem. It's not just a British problem, it's all over Europe and North, North East United States, all, we all have the same issue and we're all battling and sharing knowledge to try and resolve the issues. Heat, another issue we have, obviously the rail network, lots and lots of metal, often sat in very poor locations, historically it can be on what well, the Victorians put down in the end, it can be ash and on top of clay, and then we've got hot rails heating up all day, ultimately leads to buckles, etc. And this is the amount of incidents we have as the temperature changes. So what we tend to see is anywhere between 6 and 15 degrees, railway operators normal, between 0 and 20 degrees, not a huge difference, and we start seeing a massive change as the heat goes up or the heat goes down a lot more incidents. <coughs> That's across our whole asset base. And likewise, flooding, well publicised this year. And this is the examples of some of the flooding events we've had in April. Most of these are a date when we start coming up, and this is from the National Flood Centre. And at the top, we've got April to December. <coughs> it's literally not stopped for the last six, 12 months now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> um, one of the big issues we have as well, we've seen the flooding at Cowley Bridge recently on the southwest. Is damage to reputation and being the only, one of the only providers, I think, to some parts of the southwest, and the road network was lost, the rail network was lost. Ultimately, parts of the southwest were cut off from the rest of the country for a few days. We start looking at our vision and strategy, and what we started to do is build together our vision of a ready, ready, re weather ready railway and a strategy for building in a climate change resilience. So we're not just looking at how we respond to the weather in the next 5, 10, 15 days, months or weeks. We're looking at how we're going to do that over the whole lifespan of the asset. And we be doing the lifespan for a lot of our assets. So this is how we've been explaining to a lot of people. The weather varies, we all know that. Occasionally we'll have a 1 in 5 year event, occasionally we'll have a 1 in 50, 100 year event. And what we're starting to see is more frequency and more severity in these weather events. We've been improving our asset resilience, and if we'd have carried on in this path, ultimately we would have got to a point fairly soon where our asset would have been resilient to the, to the weather. So that's, we've been measuring the gap between our asset resilience and the weather, and slowly closing that gap. Obviously, we'd like to close it quicker, but we do have the budget restraints, as we all do. Essentially, our forecasters are saying to us that this is what could happen in the future. We could have more severe weather and um, a higher frequency of the severe weather. Whether that is climate change or whether it is simply decadal patterns and cyclic weather events, I don't think there's a scientist in the world yet that can tell us that. However, it would be foolish of us to not plan for the worst case scenario. So, we were on this path of asset resilience. We're now planning on doing a lot more and potentially doing it quickly, much more quickly. Incidentally, if this does just pattern out and it comes up and comes back down again, we'll be where we want it to be earlier. So that it won't be wasted money and we'll realise the benefits of what we've done earlier. And the ultimate aim is to close or completely remove that gap from our asset resilience to the weather. And this is where we are now in reality. So we've got, we're building our asset plans, we're changing our asset, we're changing our line side, we're moving our track, we're changing the way we control our systems. <coughs> that takes time. And the next stage is to look at our short and medium term plans. So we're measuring the weather, measuring our asset resilience, understanding what the gap is, and in reality, understanding how quickly we can close that gap and how much of a gap is it acceptable? Do we want the railway to be able to cope with a three foot snow event once every five years, which may be in the future, or do we want it to be able to cope with a three foot snow event once every 20 years? And it's really big boy decisions and very tough decisions to be made, and we're very reliant on the scientific community. <clears throat> 
So we've been looking at the level of exposure for each asset, so that's that gap between what the weather is, what the asset can currently manage, uh, and what our plans are. So we found some gaps, some areas where there's no long-term plan, some areas where we've got a brilliant long-term plan, that's your short-term plan is looking like it needs improvement. So we're doing these things with looking at time scales and costs and the mitigation and whether or not the mitigation, actually sometimes the mitigation is so uh, cost effective that it may reduce our need to change the asset and make an overall saving. Some of the projects we're looking at, we're moving, we've got these 10 routes, risk registers now, seasonal preparedness, we're listing what everybody on every route needs to do for every type of weather, so if it's two centimetres of snow, everybody in the country that works on network rail will know if they have an action that they need to carry out. And that's going to be an automated system where the person will have an iPad, an iPhone, all our maintenance guys are being issued with iPhones and all the team leaders are being issued with iPads. They will get an alert saying, the weather in the next five days is this, your actions that you have previously agreed to are these, are you prepared, are you ready to do that? And then that work leads into an emergency weather action team. And the emergency weather action team is a, normally a telephone conference where we go through the actions that have not been carried out and highlight our risks and implications of them. And that's ultimately automating the whole process and allocating work through the system. So if we know the snow is going to fall, the system will allocate the work and the resources <clears throat> and the routes that will be available to us. Earthworks, we have a, quite a problem with earthworks at the moment. I think we're having quite a few landslides with the amount of rainfall we've had over the last 12 months, particularly with, since last April, May. So we're doing a lot of work about managing our earthworks and vegetation plant. So here you can see the vegetation plant. We've cut the trees back all the way up to a certain point on the rail network. And with that then, in some places, creates a risk of earthworks, slidage and uh, landslides. So we've got to be very careful and build a long-term strategy <coughs> into our short-term mitigation. So simply cutting it back one year could create a problem in two years' time. So we've got to be very careful about our strategy in that area. Vegetation management plans, I'll come on to that in a bit more in a second. We're using something called LIDAR, which I don't know if anyone, anyone here aware of LIDAR. Yeah, it's similar to radar. We've done a national vegetation survey, so we've tagged all of our trees, every tree on the whole railway network has been tagged, given a unique ID, it's a tree for certain size, actually, not bushes. And, uh, and we've tagged all them, we've done LIDAR assessments, and we're then starting to match the two together and build our risk assessment for every inch of the rail network. Huge, huge ask when you're talking 20,000 miles of track. That's the LIDAR system, it's currently done from uh, an aeroplane or a helicopter. And this is what it looks like, so we've got a plan. How, much, how close the trees can be to the railway. And that then builds into a work bank for removing the risk in the first stage. Severe weather, well, <coughs> since the recent uh, weather we've had, which isn't necessarily severe, we haven't declared it as severe, although some news agencies have. And we're looking at setting some limits for the weather and the assets and using a different set of thresholds. And instead of saying, Due to the recent severe weather, we're going to start using adverse weather, inclement weather, uh, severe weather, normal weather events, and stipulate to our guys operating um, restrictions which they can use. So we will not be telling people we've got severe weather events if we've got two centimetres of snow, which is what we did see a few months ago. <coughs> These are some of the uh, technologies we've been using that we searched all over Europe and. North America for these are brushes we've been fitted to the trains for the in London area and the third rail network. Snow sits on it very quickly. We fit these to the trains, it <coughs> brushes it off before the shoe collects the electricity from it. And these are snow displacers, very, very simple, compactable, able to move within the points but stop the snow from settling in the points which then can't compact to a point of ice. Up here we've got but people talk about um, leaves on the line. Actually, the bigger problem to us is water on the line, believe it or not, during the autumn and the dew point. We've been talking to companies with hydrophobic uh, sand products, 
and this is where they literally repel the, it's like two magnets. This sand repels water, it pushes the water away from wherever it's touching. So we're looking at putting that onto our trains and laying that onto the rails. <coughs> a, to provide the friction between the wheel and the rail, and B, to dispel the water. Photographs of what we're doing. These are our treatment trains. These run around all autumn the, and then multiple use. So, use them to jet wash. I just want to see a spout there. They jet wash the, the rails. Then we fit different equipment to them and use them for weed killing spray. And then we use them for de icing in the third rail network as well. And we've got a fleet then running. Some of these are running 22, 23 hours a day during the autumn season. A lot of use. And we're starting to move from dedicated treatment trains to work with our train operators and network rail funds the fitment of treatment being fitted on in-service trains. So if you like, it'd be like um, a bus company or a HGV company having ploughs or having gritters on their vehicles. <coughs> Some of our snow clearing equipment. We go from just simple ploughs, miniature ploughs, huge ploughs, snow blowers in Scotland. And if you can see that flowing the snow right off into railway. And we've also got something which is very similar to a huge jet engine on a train. It literally blows hot air into all the point equipment and melts everything in the area. And that moves on to the next junction. So the wings come out, jet wash, blast, hot air, move on to the next junction. Really impressive stuff. <coughs> Traction gel applicators, these for every train as they're approaching a station or a level crossing. We use these and they put down a traction gel, which is basically just a sticky substance that helps the train to brake. Massive problem for us at level crossings and stations, and track gel applicators do the job. And some of our flooding events. This is, I literally came today from a meeting to look at new types of dams that we can start using for the railway. So our long term plan, the arch that we're going to look at, that would be to raise Cowley Bridge, or to fit some sort of drainage system. The short term mitigation plan is to come up with uh, uh, objects like that and things that we can protect our assets before we raise them onto platforms, etc. And that's the end.